Good evening. Good evening. It's nice to see you here this evening, and you all remembered the time of service. I had to keep telling myself all day today, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock, so I would not forget, and I'm glad you didn't forget as well. We'll see if anybody shows up in 30 minutes. It, the order of service that we will follow this evening is the service of the word as printed in our worship folder. And our focus this evening is really on being a disciple of Christ, of that, the very fact that he has called us to faith in him, that we know that we are his disciples, that is his followers, and we enjoy and, and celebrate the forgiveness that we have through him. And we're looking at that very point tonight. Our first hymn this evening is With the Lord Begin Your Task, hymn 478, and we're going to sing the first three verses. I invite you to stand for our opening invocation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for our scripture readings. Our first scripture reading this evening is found recorded in the Old Testament book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 15, verses 15 to 21. And in these words of our Lord, Jeremiah is, well, kind of torn between two things. The one is his love for his Lord and, God, and faithfulness to God's word, proclaiming the message that God has given to him to the people of Israel. But then as a result of that, he's also receiving in persecution and ridicule on the very people he is sharing God's word with. So he feels this torment and, and anguish of what he is suffering at the hands of his own fellow citizens. But his joy and his comfort is always found, though, back in God's word and promises. We read, O Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Take take vengeance for me on those who persecute me. You are slow to anger. Do not take me away. Keep in mind that for your sake I bear disgrace. Your words came to me and I devoured them. Your words became my joy, the delight of my heart, because I bear your name. O Lord, God of armies, I did not sit with the band of party-goers, nor did I celebrate with them. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me. You filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending? Why is my wound incurable, refusing to heal? Will you be as deceptive as an intermittent stream to me, like a source of water that a person can't depend on? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will take you back, so that you may stand before me. If what you say is worthwhile and not worthless, you will be my spokesman. They must turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you like a bronze wall to this people. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. Because I am with you to save you and to rescue you, declares the Lord. I will rescue you from the hand of the wicked, and I will deliver you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is God's word. This evening we'll be looking at Psalm 121, and Jim Tice will be our cantor this evening. He will sing the psalm, and we'll join together as a congregation in singing the refrain, and then the ending, Glory Be to the Father. Psalm 121.
Our second scripture reading this evening is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, the first eight verses. And in these words, the Apostle Paul reminds us that through faith in Christ Jesus, all of us are really the body of Christ. We may have many different gifts, but we all use them to serve the Lord. And that's really the key point that he wants us to know and remember in these words. Because we are, to, in a sense, to present our lives, our bodies, as living sacrifices to the Lord. We read, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. So by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think in a way that results in sound judgment, as God distributed a measure of faith to each of you. For we have many members in one body, and not all the members have the same function. In the same way, though we are many, We are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We have different gifts, according to the grace God has given us. If the gift is prophecy, do it, in complete agreement with the faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then encourage. If it is contributing, be generous. If it is leadership, be diligent. If it is showing mercy, do it cheerfully. This is God's word. Alleluia. Your words became a joy to me and the delight of my heart. Alleluia. I invite you to stand for our gospel reading. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 26. This portion of God's word will also be the basis for our sermon this evening. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me, because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we sing our next hymn, hymn 453. A note, we'll sing verses 1 and 2 and verses 4 and 5.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. As I mentioned, the words for our sermon are our gospel reading. We've heard them, so I'll not read them again. My fellow disciples in Christ Jesus, perhaps you may recall when the first time it was that you bought, oh, let's say your first car, or maybe your house, or some other major expense, or maybe you're going to be doing it again, buying another car, or or maybe it's the first time you're going to be buying a house, whatever it might be. What's the first thing you ask yourself before you make that major purchase? Do you say and ask, well, let's see, should I get that Corvette with all the extra items attached with it, even though it makes it more expensive? Should I get it because I really want it? Or do you ask and say, oh, maybe I should get that basic no-frills sub- sur- um, Subaru Outback instead. Or the house. Should I get that brand new house that just has been built and it has all the bells and whistles? It's it's enormous, it's innate, it's beautiful. It's just what I want. Or do I buy that house that was built in the 50s and has never been updated? Are those the questions you first ask yourself before you make a major purchase? What is it you want? Or do you ask yourself, what is it going to cost? This may be what I want or would like, but really, what is it going to cost me? Can I afford to make that purchase? And when you think about it, that really should be the first question we ask ourselves before we do purchase anything. Can I afford it? What is it going to to cost me. You see, there's a lot more cost involved than just making a monthly payment on your car or a mortgage. There's the cost of repairs and upkeep and utilities and gas and insurance, and then the unexpected happens, and then there's many other things. So really, what can you afford? What's the final cost going to be for you? And if we are good managers of our resources, we will carefully look at what it's going to cost us and determine whether or not I can do it. And if that's true about earthly matters, whether it be purchasing a car, a house, whatever it might be, then what about our spiritual matters? What about being a disciple of Christ? Calculating our spiritual cost is even more important, more vital, because if you come up short, it can only mean one thing, and that is really eternal condemnation. When it comes to spiritual costs and matters, there are no shortcuts. There are no cheap deals that can be found or, or available. It's really all or or nothing. And that's why our Lord Jesus in our gospel reading this evening reminded his disciples, and he's really reminding you and I as well tonight about the cost of being a disciple. And that's really what we want to look at this evening, the cost of being a disciple of Christ. The price our Lord Jesus paid for our discipleship was was no insignificant amount. He did not barter for the best possible deal available. He did not sit there and bicker and argue with the person to haggle them down in, their, in the price. Although, generally speaking, we like to do that and, and we want to do that when it comes to purchasing certain things. We just don't say, okay, here, but we want to get the best deal possible. Nor did our Lord Jesus quibble about a few pennies here or there. Nor did he try to cut any corners. He paid the ultimate price. The most expensive price that had to be paid. One that you and I could not afford to pay. And the price that he paid for us to be his disciples was his own blood. As the Apostle Peter reminds us when he wrote, 
because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. The cost of you and I becoming members of Christ's discipleship was really to us nothing. Nil. Not one cent. God did not charge us uh, an entrance fee in order to be a member of, of his discipleship. And he does not charge us a monthly maintenance fee that we have to pay every month in order to keep our membership in good, good standing. The cost to you and me is that wonderful, beautiful word that we like to hear, free. What is this going to cost? Nothing. It's free. Don't you love it when you hear someone say to you, here, have this, and you say, what's it going to cost? It's free. Well, that's what it cost us. Nothing. But it was not without its cost. It cost God plenty. It cost him the life of his son. And Jesus, as he is speaking to his disciples here in our, in our gospel reading, is for the very first time pointing out to his disciples what is it that he has come to do and why he is going to Jerusalem. He was going there to die, to give his life as payment. For he told them, he says, and so Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Think about it. Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, God Almighty himself, what did he do? He became lower than his own angels and took upon himself our flesh and our blood and became obedient to death, even death on the cross, so that he can make the payment for sin in full. He allowed himself to be arrested by those he came to save. He suffered the humiliation of being spit in the face, slapped in the face, beaten, a crown of thorns shoved on his head, and he was scourged till his black was a bloody mess. And then he suffered something even worse than all of that. The curse of being nailed to a cross. Because as it is written, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, curse is everyone who hangs from a tree. And Jesus willingly paid that price so that you and I could be his disciples. He didn't hesitate to do it. He didn't have any second thoughts about it and say, well, you know, that's a little steep. That might be too steep. I'm not willing to go that far. No, he paid it. He paid it because he knew that you and I could not make that payment. He knew that you and I do not have the right amount of righteousness. You and I do not have that perfect obedience that the law requires of us. And you and I definitely do not have that precious blood that can make payment for sin. But Jesus did. Jesus does. And so he willingly made the payment the payment of his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Jesus knew the price for our discipleship. He knew what it was going to cost him. And he was not going to let anyone or anything get in the way of him making that payment. And so after he had told his disciples what was going to happen to him, Peter duped by Satan and says, Lord, I'll never let this happen to you. Don't even think about such a thing happening. I will prevent it. But Jesus wasn't swayed by Peter's argument. Jesus knew that he was a great temptation at that moment to him, Peter, that is. And he says, Peter, get away from me, for you are but Satan. I will have nothing to do with what you have to say. Get behind me. 
You do not have mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus knew the cost. He knew the price. And he was willing and he did pay that price so that you and I are now his disciples. And he reminds us of that ultimate price he play, paid for us, for our discipleship, each time we come before the Lord's altar and partake of his body and blood together with the bread and wine of Holy Communion. There he reminds us of the tremendous price that our Lord Jesus paid, his life his blood, his body on the altar of the cross so that you and I would have the gift of being his disciples. That cost for us is nothing. But there is a cost with being a disciple of Jesus. It cost us nothing to be one. But there is a cost for us in also being a disciple. And listen to what Jesus says to you and to me tonight. He says, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The price take for being a disciple of Christ is really twofold for us. It is the denying of ourself and taking up the cross and following him. Before an immigrant who has come to the United States can become a citizen of the United States, they first must renounce their commitment and allegiance to their former country. And then they must pledge 100% allegiance to the United States. Then and only then will the United States government grant them citizenship. And it's really no different when it comes to you and I being disciples of Jesus. It is the renouncing, the, in a sense, if you want, the saying that I have, will have no longer any allegiance to the devil in his sinful ways. It is also renouncing that we will follow the ways of the world and the desires of our sinful flesh. That's the price, the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. You see, you and I really cannot have a divided heart and be a disciple of Christ. We can't say, well, I'll follow Jesus, but I'm not going to give up the ways of this world. We cannot say, I will follow Jesus, but I'm not going to give up the desires of my sinful heart. I want those things too much. That is not being a disciple. You can't split time between Christ and and the devil, and the world in our sinful flesh. And that's why the Lord says, if you want to follow me, then deny yourself. Deny your sinful desires and walk with Jesus. That's the price. Are you willing to pay it? Are you paying it? And that's not the only price and cost of being a disciple. There's more than just the denying of one's sinful self. It also includes being willing to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Our Lord Jesus never promised that our life as a disciple would be one of a, of a bed of roses, one where there'd be no problems, no difficulties we encounter along the way. Actually, he told us it would be quite the exact opposite. To be a disciple of Jesus means you're also going to have to bear the cross. And that cross will come in many different ways. That cross that you and I are to take and to carry may be more than just, let's say, an illness or a hardship in our life. That is part of it and can be. But it really is so much more. The cross we are to bear is also the one that comes from the heavy burden of just simply being a disciple of Jesus. Because the world doesn't love you. The world wants nothing to do with you as a disciple of Christ. And the world will ridicule you. The world will mock you. The world will persecute you. The world will condemn you. The world will cancel you out just for following in the footsteps of your Lord and being his disciple. That's the cross you will have to bear. But it's even more. 
The cross that you may have to bear may not just come from the world, but it may come from the need of maybe to lose a friend or even division in a family or a hardship along the way just because of living your faith in Christ. That's the cost. You may even have to forego certain things at work or whatever it might be. That's the price of being a disciple. And perhaps maybe even the hardest one to carry is the one where you deal with your daily struggle against your own sinful self and its desires. That's a cross, a very heavy one, because Satan uses that burden in your life to sway you, to be like the Peter and say, never, Lord, I will never allow this to happen. Yes, you and I have a cross to bear. But if we don't live our life for him who died for us, then we are in jeopardy of forfeiting the life that he won for us. Jesus said, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? And what good can a person give in exchange for his soul? That's the price of being a disciple. Are you willing to pay it? Are you paying it? The cost of discipleship Jesus paid for us with his blood. The cost of being a disciple of Christ is for you and me to deny our sinful self, the promptings of our sinful heart, and to take up the cross, whatever it might be, whatever we may, we may be called upon to carry, but to carry it and to take that cross and follow the Lord. Granted, that will not be easy, and it is not easy. But we do have this promise from our Lord, and that through his word and his sacraments, he will always lift us up. He will always give the, us, us the assurance of his love and, and forgiveness, and he most definitely will give us the strength and the means to be his disciples. So my fellow disciples in Christ Jesus, as we will sing in the next hymn, let us ever walk with Jesus. Let us follow his example pure. Let us flee the world which would deceive us and the sins that really allure us away. Let us with all hope and faith and love do our Father's bidding. For that's the cost of being a disciple. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join together and confess our faith in our Lord with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord, the giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for the gift of faith you have given us to know and to find comfort in the forgiveness we have through our Lord Jesus. By your grace, you have called us to be your disciples and to live our lives to the glory of your name. You paid the ultimate price for us to be your disciples, and that was the shedding of your blood on the cross of Calvary. You left the glory of your throne in heaven and clothe yourselves in the humility of our flesh and blood so that you and you alone could pay the full price of our ransom from sin and death. May we with thankful hearts live our lives for you who died for us. Help us by giving us your strength each day to deny the desires of our sinful flesh and to be willing to carry whatever cross comes our way. And may our lives be a reflection of your love for all people. Also, dear Lord, be with Betty Gettner and Dennis Dye, both of whom are at St. Joseph Hospital. 
Grant healing to Betty, who is fighting an infection, and restore her to full health so that she can return home very soon. Continue to be with Danny as he continues his rehabilitation at St. Joe's. Restore his strength and mend his broken shoulder so that he too can go home in the very near future. Be with all who are sick and give each and every one of them the comfort of your abiding presence. And finally, we thank you for the many blessings you have given to Craig and Lisa Rathen as they celebrate their 28th wedding anniversary. As husband and wife, they have made sure that you have always been first in their marriage. They have grown together in their love and commitment to you and to each other. Continue to be with them and bless their life together as husband and wife for many more years to come. And we pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus and together now join in the prayer he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn.
I invite you to stand as we close with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Again, good evening to all of you. I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. It's always a joy to be able to gather together in God's house and, and lift our voices in praise and thanks to him. Uh, the announcements are there in the bulletin. Please take note of them. Nothing really out of the ordinary. Uh, God's blessings to all of you. Be safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs>